but things change when you're down in the valley. Don't you lose faith for your never alone for the God on the mountain is still God in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right the God of the good times is still Oh, you talk about your faith When you're up on the mountain The talk comes so easy When life's at its place Now it's down in the valley Of trial and temptations that's when your faith is really put to the test with the God on the mountain is still God on the mighty when things go That's a great truth in song. The God of the mountain is the God in the valley. You know, mountaintops are fun. Problem is there's no food up there. No food on top of the mountain. You've got to go down in the valley. And uh, someone once told me about preaching. They said, if you'll just speak to brokenhearted people, you'll always have an audience. And that's true. And I got thinking about starting in 2 Corinthians here. And last week I went over all the things that Paul had suffered and how miserable life was to him. And we talked about this being such a unique book because he is really going to talk a lot about himself. And he's going to admit some things throughout the book that are very personal. And it reads kind of like a private journal. And you learn more about the man in this book than in any other part of his writings. He still remains the great apostle, but he doesn't remain a person who isn't affected by his world. I mean, this is a guy who had been thrown in jail. He had been beaten. He had been shipwrecked. He had been left in the sea. And of all those things, if I had a choice, uh, I would put the sea as the last thing I'd want to do, to be stuck out in the middle of the ocean, in the deep, in the dark. And so today, we're going to be looking at the first 11 verses. And in the, in the first uh, two, he gives a, a beautiful hello. We're going to look at that. And then he goes on and talks about, what about when you are in the valley? Uh, I've entitled this, the de From Despair and Despondence to Comfort. Uh, when, I, when I got thinking about that, I got thinking about Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know if you've ever read Pilgrim's Progress. It's, it's a great book. It's about a guy named Christian. And he's trying to make it to the celestial city. And it's just a metaphor of life. And he's going through all of the things that he goes through. And he's trying to get to the celestial city. And as he moves further away from his home, he encounters more and more problems. And along the way, he loses more and more friends. Isn't that the way it goes? Uh, the closer you get, the deeper you get in problems, have you noticed the less friends you seem to have? 
Everybody loves you when you're on top, but when you're down, everybody goes away. Is it, have you figured out that uh, when people ask you how you are, they really don't want to know? <laughs> now, you can do your own personal test on this. The next time somebody says, well, how the heck are you? Start telling them. <laughs> and they'll disappear pretty quick. You know, it, what was that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People? I could write a book called How to Run Them Off. Just tell them how you feel. <laughs> and, uh, and they'll just go away. But, you know, why? Why do people do that? Because people don't know how to help. People don't know what to do. So I, I was thinking about Pilgrim's Progress. And I was thinking about uh, uh, Christian's route. And the most interesting part of, the, uh, of his travels is he gets caught in the slough of despond. That sounds like a bad place to me. I mean, it, the slew of despond. I, I remember when I was a kid, they had a rock quarry, and, uh, and we used to go play on it and, you know, ride our bikes on it. And, you know, just, you, you know, it was a rock quarry. It was one place we could go where we wouldn't break anything. And, uh, and it, it had this thing at the bottom of one of the places where they were pulling out of the rock quarry. And it was just this nasty kind of silvery brown blue looking stuff like he didn't ever want to touch that I mean it, it like glowed in the dark and 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 that's what the image I get when I think about the the slew of despond and when Christian got there he had a friend named Pliable he has all these friends with funny names and Pliable was with him and Pliable of course it, it, that's the kind of friend he was he was Pliable till they got to the flu of uh, the, the the slew of despond and he was gone he was out no more pliable. But he runs into a guy named Help. And in the book, and, and I encourage you to read the book, it's got a lot of these and thous and all that, but if you can get past all that old English language, there's some great things. And I was reading about the pool of despond. It says, such a place that cannot be mended. The descent where the scum and the filth of sin does continually run. Fears and doubts and discouraging apprehensions and all of them get together and they settle in this place. This is the reason for the badness of this awful ground. Whew, that sounds, that sounds bad. That sounds rough. But it doesn't sound any rougher than the pool of despond that we find ourselves when we suffer. You know, everybody suffers. I think the funny thing is, is, is we, we attempt, and it's a, it's a, a bad attempt, we attempt to, to not show the fact that we're suffering. But in this room, there's lots of pain. There's pain of loss. Some of you have lost a loved one along the way. There's the pain of, uh, of a child's death. There's all kinds of pain within relationships. There have been broken relationships. You've been violated by business partners. You've been hurt by people that you normally could trust in, organizations and agencies that you count on for, for your health, and, and, and they've let you down. The world is filled with the pool of, of, the, of despondency, and we get stuck in it. And the truth is, when we get there, poems and scripture and sometimes are not, not a help. I mean, this is a great song. The, the, the Lord of the mountain is the Lord of the valley. But, you know, that's cognitive knowledge. But when you're in the middle of the slew of despond, it just passes over you and makes no sense. Because you're asking the question that all of us ask, I don't, unless you're, you're the only spiritual one in the room, but, but that question is, why me? Why this? Why now? And it doesn't matter how deep your faith goes, and it, it doesn't mean that you don't have a deep faith if, if when you suffer there are serious times of doubts. When you get stuck in the slew of despond, it's hard to get out. And you don't just step in and then step out. 
Christian needed somebody. He was stuck. He was going no further. He was sunk in that quicksand. That's the same with suffering. It's like, what is this, God's one mistake? Is this a, a quicksand that he has planned for me? What is the cruel lessons that I have in this? I heard a guy one time call this, uh, you know, suffering, God's gift for you. Well, all of us would say, well, no thanks. I would say, God's gift for me, the gift that nobody wants, you can have it back. Who wants that? But yet there has to be a reason, and there is, and Paul will cover that reason. But what happened in the slew of despond for Christian was somebody came along, and their name was Help. And Help reached down his hand. And Help doesn't try to describe what he was going through. Help doesn't try to explain it to him. Help doesn't tell him he shouldn't feel the way he's feeling. What does help do? Help comforts him and pulls him out of the slew of despond. You know, uh, I love C.S. Lewis and just, just an amazing mind, probably the uh, one of the greatest theological minds to ever live and, and probably one of the greatest folks of the 20th century in terms of faith and all that he did and all that he wrote. And I, I highly encourage you, go get a C.S. Lewis book of any kind and begin to read it. It's just rich. And uh, there he was after the death of his wife. And he went back up to the university where he was teaching and the vicar said to him, uh, he called him Jack, he said, Jack, put his arm around him to comfort him. And he said, God knows. God knows. God knows. And C.S. Lewis looked at him and he said, I know he knows. My struggle is, does he care? Whoa. Does God care? That's a question not easily answered. Now, we know that he does. We got that here. We know that God cares. We know that God loves us. We know that nobody loves us with the kind of love that God has. He has loved us with an everlasting love. And with loving kindness, he draws us to himself. We know that. But when you're in the slew of despond, sometimes... It doesn't make a difference. And you suffer. And you're in pain. Well, Paul's going to talk about that. And he's going to give us all something to do when we're in the slough. He's going to give us something to do when we're out of the slough, but can remember the slough. He's going to very pointedly come into this church, this kind of disobedient, weird uh, mixture of people that he has taken a whole book that we've gone through and, and balled them out over several issues, and he's going to pull them close like a friend. It is humbling and honoring when, when somebody is suffering and they seek you out. And when they do... You need to be ready to be a part of their healing, not their pain. So, listen to Paul Solo. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. And he doesn't call Timothy an apostle, but he's calling himself an apostle, and he's establishing it. But the way he says it, he says, this is Paul, and I, I'm an apostle, not because I deserve it or because I've earned it or some board of men decided I was going to be that. God has chosen me. And, and so I am in that position. He says, I am writing to God's church in Corinth and to all of his holy people throughout Greece. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I dare say that that is such a wonderful greeting to say to somebody, may you have grace and peace. And what does that mean? May you have salvation. The only way you understand grace is by accepting the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior and giving all that you know about you to all that you know about him. And one of the blessings about suffering many times is it 
puts us in a place of such helplessness that we reach out to God. And in, the, in, our, in our object poverty mentally to get through a, a time of suffering, many times people reach out to God. And Paul is saying, grace, the grace that is on you, the salvation that you have, because he follows it up with the only way to have peace is to know God. You cannot have peace outside of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when suffering comes in, even that peace is disrupted and pushed around. And so what he wants for this church is for them to have salvation and peace. And then he gets into the meat of what I want to talk about. He starts right up front. He doesn't waste any time. And, and he, he says, all praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and our source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubled. We will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For, for the more we suffer for Christ... The more, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighted down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can, you can patiently endure the same things that we suffer. And we are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort of, that God gives us. And we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the troubles we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed. We were overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we had thoughts that we would never live through it. Interesting portion of scripture. I love this portion of scripture. It, it sounds a little bit like a tongue twister, you know? Uh, how much wood would, would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Or, you know, just it sounds like one because you comfort, 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 trouble, 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 comfort. And it, it goes on. As a matter of fact, in these verses, uh, he will say comfort uh, it really. In five verses, he says comfort ten times. Now, if Paul is going to use the word comfort ten times, that means that the word comfort has got to have some sort of meaning to it for him to bring it up. You know, when, when your car breaks and, uh, and, and you don't know what to do, which is anytime my car breaks, I don't know what to do. I mean, I can, I can get out front and I can open the hood and I can go, uh-huh. And that's about all I can do. So what do I do? I have to call somebody to come pick it up and carry it somewhere, right? To someone who can do more than go, uh-huh. You know what that's called? It's called a wrecker. So you call a wrecker. And he, and he tows you away. And he takes you to a wrecking yard. All sounds bad, doesn't it? You know, over in England, they don't call it a wrecker. Over in England, they call it a rescue vehicle. So when your car breaks down, you call a rescue vehicle. And then the rescue vehicle gives you a lift. Nice, right? And it takes you to the recovery property. Now, how much better does that sound? That's really what Paul's going to try to explain to us. He's trying to explain to us that when, when the people of God get in the slew of despair, you, you don't need to be a wrecker. You don't need to be towing. You don't need to dump them off in the, in the, in the, in the yard. You need to be a rescue vehicle. You need to give people a lift. You need to take them to the recovery property. It just sounds nicer. I should say it in an English language. But those are, those are all the words that he wants us to hear. And these are, these are words of, 
of uh, comfort and encouragement. The word comfort used 10 times in five verses. Guess what? It's the same word out of John 14, 16. Let me remind you what John 14, 16 says. Jesus is about ready to go to the cross. He's going to die. He's got these men with him. They're, they're frustrated because they don't understand the plan. And Jesus says to them, uh, I must go, but I'm going to send one who is greater than I am. The comforter. The comforter. And he will not only be with you, he will be in you. Now do come Wednesday and hear about the Holy Spirit because this is one of the amazing things related to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament had, had a, a different way of working. The Holy Spirit came in two phases. Phase one was the Holy Spirit would come alongside. And as long as the Holy Spirit was alongside of you and you were obedient, the Holy Spirit would empower you. That's why, that's why when, when David sins against God and he has his affair with Bathsheba in Psalm 51, he begs God. He says, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Because the Holy Spirit would move away from people in their disobedience. Samson was strong for Israel. He protected Israel. Uh, he, he, he would kill the Amalekites, the Jebusites, the Mosquito Bites, any of them that were coming after the nation of Israel. He was on it. But then he was disobedient. Got his hair cut in the wrong barber shop. And when that happened, the Holy Spirit left him and attached to somebody else. Jesus is telling his men, now that I have been here, now that I have set this example, now that I will go and do redemption for you on the cross, I will send another, the comforter, and he will not only be with you, he will be in you. And on the words of Jesus, the ministry of the Holy Spirit changed from that point to this. You no longer have a Holy Spirit that comes along the side of you and is here as long as you're obedient. Thank you. How long would he have been with me? Not very long. How long would he have been with you? Maybe a little longer than me. But we'd all be crying out in the slew of despair, not knowing what to do. But on the word of Jesus, we get the Holy Spirit not only with us, but inside of us. The comforter. The comforter. And that is this ongoing comfort from God. And so Paul, when he's going to talk to them about how he wants them to be comfort to others, he's going to use the word, same word, comforter, same meaning. And let me tell you what dawned on me when I thought of that. What dawned on me was, we have the Holy Spirit of God. How amazing is that? We are sealed until the day of redemption, not because of we're capable of being obedient, but just because God chose to do it. And we have the personality and the nature of God living inside of us, educating us, talking to us, caring for us, guiding us along in every decision we make, and confronting us, and loving us, and comforting us. And what Paul's going to say, he's going to say, church, I want you to be I want you to be the Holy Spirit in somebody's life. Along with the Holy Spirit that they have, I want you to go to them and I want you to comfort them. I want you to be God with skin on. Now some of you, you're real excited to hear that Paul wants you to be the Holy Spirit. Because some of you have worked your whole lifetime to be the Holy Spirit in somebody else's life. Right? Somebody asked me if, if, I hear, uh, if I hear an audible voice from God. And, and I always tell him, yeah, and it's an alto. It's a female alto voice. I hear it all the time. <laughs> Matter of fact, when Coach Donna gets too instructional with me, I start calling her HS. But this is the good side of this. This is the side that excites us. This is the side that says, because you know Jesus, because he is your savior, because he is not only with you, he is in you, you have the character and the nature of God. And because you have that, I'm going to put you in a situation where when somebody is in the valley, in the, in the slew of despond, you're there. 
and you're there, and you're not just there, but you know what to do. You know what to do because you have been in that same slough. You've been there. You know about it. Who's best to minister to somebody in a wheelchair? Another person in a wheelchair. We have our soldiers coming back emotionally, mentally damaged and, and physically damaged. And, and who, who is best suited for them? But another soldier who knows what to say, who knows what they're going through. Uh, a mom who's, who's uh, excited about a baby only to have a miscarriage. Who's the best person for that person? A person who has loved somebody and they weren't loved back and their mate left them for somebody else. Who's best to minister to that person? Somebody who's been through that. Somebody who's battling alcoholism and doesn't know how to get away from it. You need somebody near you who has the comforter in them who can say assuredly from God, I'm here to help. And when you say you don't understand, you can look them right now and say, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I've been in the same slew with you. You see, our pain and our suffering has a reason. And he, he starts out with that reason. He gives us the first reason for suffering. And suffering is such a mystery. I am so excited just to get a reason for suffering. So in verse 4, he says, He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubled. And we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. You are going in as an ambassador of Christ. You are going in as the Holy Spirit himself. And the idea is we are there through our suffering to learn that we can comfort others. Look at verse 5. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort uh, through Christ. And, and then six, he says, even when we are weighted down with troubles, it is for your comfort and your salvation. For uh, when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. And then you can potentially endure the same things we suffered. You see how he's, he's talking about how to get in there, how to, be, how to be in the process with you, how to take care of you because of what they've been through. And uh, I think about how that, how that has happened so many times in my own life. I remember when, uh, when Donna's brother was uh, diagnosed with angioplastia anemia. Never heard of it. You, you go to Dr. Google because you know, you know nowhere else to go. And you learn that that's what, uh, that's what took Tom Landry. And, and it's, like a, it's like a leukemia. And, uh, and I, was trying to, I was trying to comfort Donna and, and, and having some success, but not a lot of success. And there was a, there was a little gal named Susie Bastian. And Donna didn't know Susie. And Susie didn't know Donna. But she had heard that Donna's brother had angioplastia anemia. And the phone rang. And it was Susie. Donna, you don't know me, but I, I know who you are, and I heard your brother has this disease. My brother had the same disease. Can I meet you for lunch? And she became the comfort, the helper. She became that person to pull Donna out of the slew of despondency and despair, to give her hope. And didn't have a lot of hope to give. Susie's brother died. Susie's brother died exactly the way Donna's brother would go on and die. But I shudder to think, had God not provided Susie in Donna's life, how much more difficult it would have been on her. Instead, I saw her walk through that process with her brother. I saw it, uh, I saw it make a difference. I remember standing in line at Tom Thumb and I had two things of sherbet and I just want to get through the line so I can go eat my sherbet and there's a lady in front of me and she does her card and it's she didn't do it right got to do it again so she does it again didn't do it right 
she does it again, didn't do it right. The little guy that's checking her out, he's kind of rolling his eyes. I'm, I'm sort of going, mm. you know, I want to set the sherbet down and go over and go, mm, there you go. <laughs> and about the time I am completely exacerbated, debating if I shouldn't go get two more fresh sherbets as these are melting in my hands. <laughs> the lady looks back at me and the two other people in line. She said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't know. I, I was just diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. The little guy checking her out went. I'm standing there with Sherbert going, uh, okay, I need to do something. I don't know what. And about then, a little lady slipped by me. And she walked over and she put her arm around the lady and she slid her card through. And she said, who's your doctor, dear? And she told her who her doctor was. And she said, that means you have so-and-so as an oncologist. Yes, it does. And she said, oh, he is so wonderful. You've got a wonderful doctor. You've got a tremendous oncologist. She gave the lady her name, and she said, I'm your new best friend. And, uh, and she looked at the little guy, and she said, take her groceries and just set them aside. We're going to go over here. And she put her arm around her. And they sat down, and she started talking to her. And she said, when's the appointment? And the lady told her, and she put it in her phone. She said, I'll be picking you up and taking you to the appointment. Have you told your husband yet? No. Okay, let's go over that. And, you know, my sherbet was completely melted because I wasn't going to leave. I wanted to watch this thing happen. And I watched this woman take this woman from absolute despair and give her unbelievable hope. Pulled her right out of the slew of despond and said, we're going through this together. And I thought, that's it. That's what God is looking for from us. He's looking for us to, in our pain, out of our pain, to do ministry. To do it effectively. God has an idea for our suffering that it not go to waste. And we just need to recognize that. Many, many of you do. Uh, in, in verse 8, he says, we, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the troubles we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. There are things that are going to happen to you in life, and that's the way you're going to feel. Experiences that you encounter that you never thought you would encounter, and yet they're on you. And there's a frustration and an anger that comes with it, and God takes all that. And he, he takes the information you get while you're in the, flu, the slew of despond, and then he lifts you out of that slew. The pain is still there. It never goes away. You are different. I hate it when people say, well, this is your new normal. I just want to say, shut up. There is not a new normal. When you've suffered a great dynamic loss, there is no such a, a thing as normal. There's simply loss. And God will take that loss and he will use it in his sweet, wonderful way. And he'll make you a comfort to others. I hope she doesn't mind me sharing this, but I'm just looking at Peggy. At Christmas time, lost a beautiful, precious daughter in high school to a car accident. Horrible thing. Beautiful girl. And her and EA went through their pain, they went through their sorrow, they went through their suffering. And they, are, they were the best people I know when someone faced something like that to introduce them to because they had taken their pain and after being out of the slough they allowed God to use them in an unusually wonderful way. So that's what God does. 
second thing that he wants us to do. One of the reasons why we suffer the, the slew of despond is so that we wouldn't trust ourselves. Um, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but you're not terribly trustworthy to yourself. Have you noticed that? I know me really well, and I'm not very trustworthy. I can't count on me. Every time I've counted on me, it's been a mistake. Every time I've counted on God, it has produced something that God wanted to produce. Look at, uh, look at verse 9. In fact, we expected to die. He's saying we didn't, we didn't think we were going to make it through. Our, our expectation was we were going to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. What a great lesson. What a thing to get out of suffering. What a, what a unique understanding. You know, uh, uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you can almost say it with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. All through Scripture, we're told, <laughs> last person in the world to trust, yourself. You're to take your trust and transfer it from you to God. And we are to trust God for all things. Doesn't matter what it is. In all things, we have to begin to trust God. I love it when you go to the hospital and, and the, the people will come out and you'll ask them how their loved one is. And they said, well, you know, at this point, all we have is to just trust God. And I don't do it because it'd be insensitive, but I want to just look at him and say, that's all we ever had. That's all you ever had was the opportunity to trust God. If it wasn't for God, there wouldn't be a hospital. If it wasn't for God, there wouldn't be a doctor. If it wasn't for God, there wouldn't be a discovery of any kind. It's all God. And one of the reasons we fall into the slew of despond is so that we learn to stop trusting ourselves and begin to trust God in a new and a fresh way. I love God's promise, and, and, and everybody quotes this scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. And sometimes when I hear it, I just shake my head and think, you don't even know what that's about. I know my plans for you, says the Lord. Not, of, not for destruction, but for a future and a hope. Beautiful promise. And people will quote that, they'll claim it. They'll wander. And I'm thinking, do you know the context of that? Have you ever studied what was going on? What was going on was Israel was being completely disobedient to God. And Jeremiah was crying out to Israel, you keep the disobedience going and we're going to be captive by somebody. The Babylonians are going to sweep in here and they're going to, they're going to take us. The Assyrians are going to come and they're going to put us in captivity. Bad things are going to happen. And that's exactly what happened. That's the plan that God had for them. He sent them into the despond of despair, the slew of despair, for a hundred years. That was the result of that promise. Now I've messed that up for you. Some of you have been using that as a good promise. But the promise wasn't that it was going to be all wonderful. The promise was it was going to be painful. And what would happen out of that pain? How that pain would come the nation of Israel. And here we are thousands of years later. And any other, any other nation, any other people would be gone from the face of the earth. And there they stand. Like a jewel. On planet earth. See God wants us to comfort others. And that's why we suffer. And he also wants us to, to trust to trust him instead of us. I'm going to warn you, those were the two easy ones. Third thing God wants. He wants us to give thanks. I'm sorry, what? When you're in the midst of the trial, in the depth of it, when it's at its absolute worst, 
You know, the Lord of the mountain is the same as the Lord of the valley. Okay, the Lord of the pit. When you are in the middle of the suffering, when it's at its most intense, God wants you to be thankful. Wait a minute. Are you kidding me? Even God must understand in the middle of intense suffering, it's, you can't be thankful. Oh, thank you, Lord, I lost my child. Thank you, Lord, my, my spouse is dead. Thank you, Lord, uh, she no longer loves me and has gone away. Thank you, Lord, our, our, you know, our loved one is, is off somewhere. We have no idea where. Well, let me give you a tip. You haven't really accepted it from God until you've thanked him for it. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. Look at verses 10 and 11. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. And we have placed our confidence in him, and, and he will continue to rescue us. And you are helping us by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. I mean, Paul, he, he was being beat up. He'd been shipwrecked. I mean, people had taken ball bats to his head. And yet he's saying, I have gratitude for everything that has happened. Gratitude to God. Do you realize that there's not anything that has come into your life that God didn't, isn't aware of? That everything that enters into your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, has passed through the permissive will of holy God. Before it ever touched you, whatever disease it is, whatever trauma it is, whatever, whatever is happening in your life, uh, God has allowed it. Now, are you going to know why this side of heaven? Probably not. Probably not. There is no figuring out why. That's why why is such a hard question. Why, God? Why? And why this? And why now? Why me? I remember being in a position where I just didn't understand. I didn't understand why, why I was suffering the way I was suffering. And, and I remember crying out to God, sitting in a parking lot in a, at a lumber dealer in the middle of the night, just screaming out to God, why? Why me? Why this? Why now? What's going on? And I heard the heart of God more than any other time in my entire life. God truly spoke to me. And, and somebody would say, you know, in words? No. It was clearer than words. And here's what I heard. And you know, sometimes when you pray, you hear things and, and, and God will give you kind of the strength to get through like the next 10 minutes with what he's saying to you. And then sometimes he'll say something and that'll get you through a day or two. There's, some, there's sometimes, and it was in the midst of this suffering, where God gave me something that is going to get me through my life. When you get one of those, you just praise him and go on. Here's what God said to me. Can you be my man and never know why this side of heaven? And my first answer was amazingly spiritual. Huh? <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? That's all you got? But then I pondered it for a while. Can you be my man? Can you stand? And be my man, whether you know or not. Can you trust me instead of you? Can you be ready to comfort others without knowing? Can you have confidence in me instead of the situation?
Can you give me thanks for how I'm going to use you through this? Can you sanctify your heart so that when people see the hope that is in you and they know the trouble that's on you, they walk up to you and go, how are you standing? How are you making it? And even if they don't do it then, later when they're in a problem, what do they remember? They remember God's man in that situation. Can you be my man and never know? I gave him a rousing, okay. But not long after that, a heartfelt, thank you God for even this. Didn't fix nothing. But it moves you through. It moves you out of the, the slew of despond and despair. It picks you up and places you on a rock. So those are the things that God wants us to do. That's why we suffer, and if we suffer for no other reason, those are the three reasons. So that we're ready to comfort others. So that, so that we trust not ourselves, but we trust Him, and we become a person of great gratitude. You know, it's, it's just what God does. So I'm going to give us some, kind of just some things to handle suffering and its perplexities. Here it is. Just three suggestions. Focus on later understanding when you're in the slew of despond. When the problem comes, when it hits you, when the suffering begins, instead of focusing on the suffering constantly, begin to think about a later time. Begin to focus on how are you going to use this in my life, God? I mean, you even have one of those conversations with him like, I don't see, I don't see that this is ever going to amount to anything, but I, I'm sure you're going to use it somehow in my life. I have, I have friends who, who are out of work, been out of work for quite a while. And, uh, and, and to a person, they're strong Christians, and, and to a person, you know, what, you know what I'm hearing them say now? After being out of work for a year, two years, three years, they're saying, I never understood this. I just thought people were lazy. I just thought people had no drive. But I have learned some things in this valley that when I finally do get work, when I finally do find my place, I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do is help somebody else. And I'm thankful for what I went through. And they're talking about it as though it's past tense while they're in the middle of it. See, that's what God wants. That's what he'll do if we focus on the later lesson. Matter of fact, one of the things sometimes, you know, people come in and, and they're looking for counsel and, and they've been somewhere else and they've gotten counsel. I, I just one police officer come in and, and he had a problem. His problem was he swore. And he had come to know Jesus as his personal savior. Well, if you're a street cop, I mean, the language out there is a kind of rough. And, and he said, I just returned the language that I'm hearing. And he said, but I, I realize I'm, now I'm a Christian. I can't talk that way. Not even on the street. I need to change what it is. But it's a habit. I, I turn every room blue when I walk in. And he said, now I went to this therapist and he told me, get up in the morning, stand in front of a mirror and say every cuss word you know. And I said, how's that going? He said, not good. He said, first of all, I know a lot of cuss words. It takes me a lot of time. <laughs> and he said, but secondly, it's not stopping anything. I said, well, I think the therapist had a kind of half a good idea. I said, why don't you do the same thing, except instead of swearing into the mirror, I'm, I'm gonna ta I want you to take the Bible, I want you to open it to Psalms, and I want you to read Psalms and watch yourself reading Psalms in the mirror. And he said, well, what good is that going to do? I said, just try it. Because over in Philippians, it says, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, think on these things. You're thinking on the bad things, the bad words. But I'm going to have you thinking on what God has said. And uh, next time I saw him, I said, how's that going? He said, problem's gone. Problem's gone. The word of God has washed my mind. But he said, problem's gone. 
Now, what kind of comfort is he going to be in that area? And so we, we have these focuses. Matter of fact, what I tell people is when they're in the middle of the slew of despond, have you ever figured out that all you can think about is your problem? It's just on your mind, and you, and you feel like you went through the whole day and the whole night, and all you did was think about your problem. The truth is, if you will discipline your mind not to think about it, but then give yourself permission to think about it in small doses, God will use that to help heal you. I had a guy give me this just as a discipline. He said, when you're in the middle of a, of a struggle, of a pain, he said, give yourself 15 minutes to think about nothing else but that. But then after the 15 minutes, say, okay, uh, I'm going to let that go now, and I'm going to go do my work. I'm going to go do the things i got to do. And then a quarter to the next hour, stop what you're doing and take that 15 minutes and think about nothing but your problem. It's amazing. It's amazing what happens. What happens is you can go about five minutes, and then you're ready to quit thinking about it when you're totally focused on it. Because that's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to take your worry and your pain and your anxiety and everything that has to do with that problem, and the enemy just wants to leak it a few seconds at a time so that your brain is worthless, so that you can't get anything done, so that you're in a fog everywhere you go. And once you shut that door and you say, no, nope, I'm just going to focus on it for that period of time, and then I'm off of it, you'll find that just intense thinking you can't even stay with it for 15 minutes. So focus on the later thing that's going to happen. Second thing, there's no other way to say it. Surrender. Surrender. Just submit yourself to God and recognize that this is what he has for you. You don't have to like it. You won't like it. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. This is where God has you. This is the valley that you get to travel through. Don't travel through alone. Surrender to him. Invite him in. Allow him to tenderly care for you, to be the help that's pulling you out. And be transparent enough so that somebody else can help you as well. Be open about your pain. How open was Paul to this church? And he's saying, we thought we weren't going to survive. And, and finally we realized, oh, we're dead men, so we might as well trust God. And he delivered us. He pulled us out. Surrender. And the third thing, give thanks instead of becoming bitter. When people suffer and they come out on the other side of some great horrible circumstance, they either come out loving God, praising God, thankful that they're out of that adventure, or bitter and angry and vindictive. It goes one way or the other. And that's what Paul is telling us. You know, he's telling us, don't trust yourself, have gratitude, and find somebody else to comfort when you're in the midst of pain. Um, I want us to have a time of prayer, but what I want us to do If you're in the slew of despond and despair, I'd like for you just to, to indicate that so that we can pray for you. And the way I'd like you to indicate it is just stand up. If you're in the midst of something right now, just stand where you are. Thank you, Melody. Others, just be open. Be open. Allow God's people to comfort. Lynn's got a surgery tomorrow. Don, you got a mess at the VA. Stand up. They're not handling him right. The pain of, of uh, what he's facing and then to be mistreated. Anybody else? Okay, before I pray, I want, uh, I want some of you who see these and know them, just walk over to them, put your hand on them, and we're going we're gonna to pray.
This is what the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to comfort one another by the comfort by which we were comforted by God. And as we do, in the midst of all of it, God <coughs> takes care of not only that person, but you as well. Father, I thank you for these who have had the courage to stand up and say, I'm in the slew of despair. And Father, I, I'm, I'm in the middle, the big middle of an issue, a circumstance, a situation. And right now, I, I am in the valley and not on the mountain. And Father, I need to be comforted. So Lord, we just pray that, that your Holy Spirit would comfort them and care for them and love them to the point that when they pillow their head tonight, they do so with uh, complete and peace, complete peace, knowing that you have given grace and that you know their situation. And Father, I, I also pray that uh, those who are praying for them will help them along the way, that they will be there to be God with skin on and be uh, someone who can help them. And so, Father, I just pray that uh, as we are open to one another, as Paul said, I'm so thankful for all of you because you prayed and, uh, and God sustained us and he will sustain you. Father, give us a, a future and a hope in all things. We thank you. We pray for each of these, God. We pray for your provision, for your love. Uh, God, whatever the issue is in their lives, Lord, I just pray that uh, you would care for all of it. You see the beginning, the middle, and the end of all of it. They are in your hands. I pray, Lord, you would use them later to be the comfort to someone else in the midst of all of this pain. In Jesus' name, amen.